Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Dennis Brown, a.k.a. Mouse. Mouse, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Bart, and uh, thanks for having me. Sure, sure. This is really cool uh, to learn about Kent Drums, which I think is a sort of well-known drum brand. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where it's not, you know, the big four or five companies. It's It's sort of flew under the radar, um, but has has a neat history that I'm excited to learn uh, from an expert such as yourself. But before we start, I always think it's important to thank the people who got us connected. So um, Mr. Donnie Baird is a fellow Kent enthusiast. Yep, I thank Donnie too. He's a great guy and he has a, a vintage Kent drum appreciation page on Facebook and he uses my photo of my drums in my basement as as the front header and yeah. i'm proud of that thank yeah. you donnie yeah that's awesome and uh and then also just a shout out to mark cooper who um many people know mark's been on the show before and is just an awesome guy i've met him a few times in real life which doesn't always happen um at the drum shows and uh he's got a he's got some photos uh provided by you as well on um cooper's vintage drums.com cooper with a c um, so also a shout out to, to Mark Cooper there as well. So mouse, let's learn the history of this, this interesting company. Okay. I'd like to start with saying, uh, that the Kent family is originally from Poland. Uh, Joseph Kwiatkowski came to America because he was unwilling to fight in the Russo Japanese war. Um, cause he, he hated the, the Russians. And so he, came to America to stay with the resistant groups. And there was some resistant groups in Buffalo and in Cleveland. Interesting. So he comes over to Ellis Island and they tell him, uh, you'll have to wait at least a week to get to Cleveland. And, and, but he's, but it, they told him, but there's actually a train going to Buffalo, New York tomorrow he <laughs> goes i'll take that one so he wow. ends up in uh buffalo and he he settled down with some friends that came over earlier and he he was in the black rock area that's where he started out right here in buffalo new york and a few years later after establishing himself he went back to poland to get his family he had five children and a wife so this is around 1905 so he comes back to America with the family. And in the next few years, they would have four more children. And three of those children would be Walter, Edward, and William Kent. Hmm. So as we fast forward here, Edward um, was in uh, World War II. And at the end of the war, he was uh, liberating Nazi concentration camps. And at this time, William Kent was working at the Gretsch factory. So when when uh, Ed got out of the service, he started a, a company and he called it the Excelsior Drum Company. And they're located on in uh, Hollis, Long Island. Hmm. And and when uh, Bill decided to resign from Gretsch and join Edward in his business. So not too long after that, they decided that they wanted to relocate to their hometown of Buffalo, New York. And they did that. And they opened up shop on a street off of Seneca Street called Nichols Place. And they were there for, for a few years. And that's where they started getting the equipment to build shells and whatnot. Well, they needed more space. So they moved down the street into the Larkin Warehouse building, this huge seven-foot-tall building, and they're on the fourth floor. So after being there for quite some time, four years at least, hmm. uh, Bill tells me Edward uh, did not like driving into the city, probably mainly because of the bad winters. Sure. So, so Edward, you know, being the owner of the company, he purchased some property out in the town of town of Tonawanda, right on the border of Kenmore. And that's where they built um, the current factory, which is still standing there, by the way. Hmm. And when they when they first started out, it, it took like a, a year to build. And they only had about like 10 employees. So 
Wow. That's but they were, they were building drums for different companies like Revere, Paramount, Vibratone. Sort of Lincoln. like white label or whatever. Like, like we'll make the drums, then you slap your logo on it kind of Yes, that's, deal. What, that's what they would do. They would, you know, people, people would order drums and Kent would make the drums, but then they would put their logo on the drum. Yeah. Like the, the Revere logo. Sure. And but it was right around this time that they decided to start making drums with their own name, Kent. Hmm. And that's when they started out um making drums, you know, with the Kent name. Yeah. And like the very early Kent drums were white badge. And so they you know, they went through the fifties, um, making all kinds of drums, making a lot more Kent products. And then the, the 1960s hit. Yeah. Beatles come to America and everybody knows what happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ringo Starr. <laughs> um, everybody wanted to be a guitar player or a drummer. Yeah. So that's when Kent's, that's when I, I believe Kent's quality went down a mm. little bit because they're building so many sets. I mean, these, these poor guys are working uh, eight days a week, like the Beatles would say. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and and they were just banging out the drums and they 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 didn't have time. They stopped doing bearing edges and, and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Wow. So So all right, so these were like relatively like I don't want to say these were cost effective drums. These would be like affordable drums from the beginning. Is that right? I mean as opposed to like maybe a Gretsch drum set or something, these would be more uh affordable. From from the start, oh yeah, exactly. And you know, you know, Kent gets a lot of a uh, lot of slack for being a lower end drum set. Although they did make some higher end stuff, I, I I have sets. Mark Cooper has had sets, so trust me, we realize yeah. that they did make a decent drum. Sure, but this is this is what Bill told me, and this this sums up the whole Kent philosophy and history. This is a quote from Bill Kent. He said, The inspiration and the purpose of the birth of Kent drums was to give the youth the opportunity to be able to have an affordable drum outfit, which was known as a starter drum set. Mm -hmm. Bill Kent. So that sums it up for me. And yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of like uh, it's a it's a good cause. Now, I want to ask this, too. So Bill Kent, you said, worked at Gretsch. Um, were these guys, were Bill and Edward, were they, you know, drum set players themselves? Uh, no, they were not. Okay. Um, they never learned the drums. They just didn't have the desire. They just they just wanted to build uh, sets. It's, <laughs> it's still kind of a unique story if you think about it. Yeah. Because all your, you know, like, William F. Ludwig III, he was a drummer, mm -hmm. but Ed and Bill Kent, no, they're businessmen. There's photos of of Bill Kent in the factory in a Buffalo News article, and you could tell by the way he's holding the sticks that he knew nothing about drums. I mean, it's kind of funny looking at that photo, but... Yeah, like, if you think about it, though, it's like, it's like I mean, I can't even... I'm trying to think of the most obscure kind of thing of, like, like I have nothing to do with... Like, like I'm going to go start making tennis rackets even though i don't <laughs> play tennis it's like i wonder how you get that in your mind maybe i guess uh bill working at gretch maybe he just like answered a you know it was like a job opening and he got a job or is there any like what did he do at gretch is that known well yeah he was a supervisor they actually uh uh let's see an agent approached william and they needed somebody to fill the spot of William Gretsch because William Gretsch had colon cancer. Mm. And so they actually approached Bill because Bill, Bill uh, is an engineer and somehow they got his name and they approached him about the job and he took it. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of unique too because when, when Ed opened up that shop on Hollis, Long Island, um, Bill would actually send work to Ed to Ed's shop, and he would like finish off Kent drums. He would spray 
some finishes, stuff like that. You would do odds and ends stuff, uh, put put the hardware on. It's kind of a strange story. Um, yeah, it is, but it's not unheard of where people get into drum making who aren't exactly um, drummers. It seems pretty common. I always say it on this show. I think it's come up multiple times, but like the Noble and Cooley guys, the family there, they aren't, they aren't drummers, um, but they make amazing drums and um, you don't have to be. Um, <laughs> so it's sort of a... An interesting thing there, but can we maybe sidebar and talk about um, Edward and Excelsior drums? Because I don't know much about about that. Like, how long? How was that run? Because Excelsior is not a hugely known brand either. I've seen them pop up, um, but was that was a pretty short run, right? Of Excelsior yeah, drums, I, I believe so. Because I don't think you'll find a uh, a drum set with an Excelsior badge. Um, because at when they were on Long Island, I really feel they weren't really manufacturing. They were, because because when they come came to Buffalo, I have some early Buffalo news ads. It talks about th- that they refurbished drums and then would resell them. Gotcha. So this is before they started manufacturing. They they didn't get the equipment until they were on, um, on Nichols Place. They they they. Because I, I guess they figured, well, we should start manufacturing rav- rather than refurbishing. Yeah. And so, so they, they contacted somebody uh, to, to, to build the uh, correct e- um, equipment to make mm-hmm. shells. And they did outsource. They had a place in uh, Getzville, New York, that made their, their lugs and other hardware, like their foot pedal. Yeah. Stuff like that. Kent basically, I think, manufactured the shells and then everything else was outsourced you know like like most companies do sure but, but their shells um they claim they're the best shells in the business what was there i know there's multiple different ways to make shells i mean do you have a little insight on their process on making these shells and like plies maybe talk a little bit about the the construction of the drums themselves um to be you know because to do this in-house now is like i mean for a company for a drum maker to make their own shells is pretty wild i mean that's expensive to do so um what was that process like for them well they they you know they would buy the uh maple veneer from uh uh michigan and what they would do it is that they would cut it to size for the different size drums and like the snares and the toms floor toms were were basically just two plies wrapped inside of each other with scarf joints. Mm -hmm. And then they would put in, put in a center um, mold section and then they would have to pound in these big wedges to, to push it together. And, and, you know, naturally first you would soak the plies to make them pliable. Mm -hmm. And then you would glue them up, put them in there and then squeeze them together and under heat and then after a certain amount of time, you would turn the heat off, let it let it um, cool, and then you would pop it out of there. And then from there, you would um, cut cut the correct uh, lengths of the shell. Uh, you would put on bearing edges, and then it would go to the next step, which would naturally be, uh, you know, put, putting on the uh, the drum wrap and then drilling the holes and and assembling it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a pretty basic uh, operation, but. The way they did it was Walter Kent actually worked at Chevrolet here in the town of Tonawanda. And and when the workers would leave um, for the day at like five o'clock, well, Walter would be on his way home. He would stop at the plant, take out the shells from the day shift. Then he would put in another whole set of shells and then he would cut some to size. So, so Walter was a big part of the business. Uh, plus he was a, uh, he was he was a, a machinist, hmm. so he had knowledge on on like how to make parts. Like like I truly believe he was the one that came up with the design of maybe the lugs, yeah. and then the company in Guestville would make them make them to their specs, or maybe maybe the, the Kent uh, foot pedal, because because that's what uh, Walter did at Chevrolet. So wow, you know, I mean, I don't I don't want to sound like cheesy or anything but it is sort of like a quote-unquote like american dream kind of story where it's like their their family came over and you know 
was like the whole Ellis Island thing. And then it's it's um, it's just really interesting how then they, you know, started this business and they all had great manufacturing jobs and started their own thing and used their skills. Uh, it's pretty cool, to, like a family business like that. Um, now, the company started, you know, post-World War II, late 40s. Is that right? William told me and Ed told me they started in 1946, like right after Edward um, got out of World War II. And what what I, th- I what I think is a big reason why they did drums, too, is because William already had knowledge on how to construct the drums with his um, working at working at uh, Gretsch. Yeah. And when when uh, when Edward started Excelsior, um, he would you know, he would have to walk through the Gretsch plant and he got ideas by looking at how they did things. And if, if you look at uh, that period of drums from Gretsch and Kent, there's a lot of similarities. Like the shells, they bolted and used reinforcement hoops. Um, hmm. Which was super th- common in the day, in that day for like insurance, basically, of not having it go out of round, <laughs> you know? With- yeah, and, and to be honest with you, in, uh, in all these years of collecting, I've never once seen a shell that was out of round. Maybe once I did, and the reason f- for it being, I recently worked on a drum where it it's it, it was an old drum probably sitting around for years it had the top head on but it somebody took off the bottom rim hmm. so you could see uh the the lugs started caving in on themselves because yeah. there was nothing supporting that that bottom part of the, the lug yeah so then it would bend upwards you know through moisture and all that so yeah the key to keeping those drums round uh and round i believe is is by keeping the, the rims on. You know, yeah. you take the rims off, you're just gonna, you know, lose everything. But sure. But all the, I've never seen a, a drum that was like really warped. Hmm. You know, their their bass drum hoops they warp because there's really nothing supporting them. Yeah. Really, they they warp a lot. I, I've I have a lot of bad, uh, you know, bass drum hoops that are warped, but then I have a lot of nice ones too. Well, I mean, like. Like you said, there's nothing supporting it. And it reminds me of like if you take the strings off a guitar, which I learned the hard way, and then like exactly. hang the guitar up, the neck start. It's meant to be tensioned. Um, yes. So uh, I was wondering about. So a quick question kind of uh, unrelated to the construction is. In their span, I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously making with with their kind of like mission statement for like making affordable, nice drums that people can have. Did they ever have like endorsers that were like uh you know drummers out there playing these drums and and you know they're proudly representing kent well i've only come across a few people that um like joey kramer from aerosmith started out on set of kent's interesting uh a local drummer around here named paul varga who was in the band talus which featured dave constantino paul and billy sheehan we you know went on to play with Mr. Big, with David Lee Roth. Yeah. Um, so Talis is one of uh one of Buffalo's treasures and I've known uh Paul and Dave for forty years for God's sake, because when I was young, I was seventeen, eighteen years old, I was working at a nightclub called Harvey and Corky Stage One, and I got to see all the local bands and one of them was Talis. Cool. And so I, I've done interviews with Paul. Uh, I, I I have a picture. What what, he, what Paul did is he wanted because Kent sold four piece sets, and when Paul saw Dave Clark on TV, he wanted a five piece set. So he bought another Tom, and he he found a way of hooking that Tom Tom on onto the this uh bass drum so we had two tom toms and i have a picture of that in my book um what was it D- dave Weckel? yeah i believe has using kent he's used kent snares on some recordings interesting i could see uh, that being one of those deals where like similar to the japanese stuff where like somehow these snares are awesome you know they're they they're they're very affordable but like they have that special like uh secret sauce <laughs> that like Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, which you can't put your finger on why, but it 
it, it worked out. You know, so they didn't have any big endorsers because I, I don't believe they wanted that in the first place. But, you know, all your big stars, you know, they wanted to play Gretsch, sure. Ludwig, Slingerland. It's just, just the way it was back then. And they were a small company, so they they did they did not want fame and fortune. You know, they, they just wanted to make the drums and stay low key. They they, they ne- Bill told me they never tried to take it to the next level because they didn't want that. Yeah. One, once uh, Rogers Drums approached them about moving their business uh, into the Rogers plant and, and make uh, affordable drum drum sets for them. Hmm. But the Kent brothers declined because they wanted to stay in Buffalo. Naturally, you got your family here. And, you know, they could have could have did that and taken it to the next level. But that's what that's not what they were all about. They did not want yeah. to do that. Yeah. Well, an interesting thing, too, just, you know, it, it's anytime I've ever seen pictures of a Kent drum set it's always a four piece so it's interesting to hear about a five piece being made you know it seems like they're always the um kind of what you think of with with that like that 60s 50s 60s style four piece kit um went with the matching snare and the tom mounted off the bass drum um with a little cymbal arm so so it's neat to think of it being a um a, a five piece did they is there any info about the wraps and the finishes of like where they would source those or anything? Just, you know, on, cause there's some really cool um, finishes. Like what, is there any info on that? Well, w- what I have found out um, there's a local company here, which I'm sure you heard of DuPont. Mm-hmm. They helped develop the uh, Marlar drum head for uh, Remo. Mm-hmm. Well, I had found proof that it looks like uh, Dunlop right here, which would have been just not far from the factory at all, was making Kent's drum wrap. That's that's the only source I, I've I've come across. Interesting. And, uh, and, and and well, I believe in one of my interviews with Bill, that's that's what he mentions, and it makes perfect sense. And, you know, the, and they had their red, black, and and uh, blue swirl. Which was um, or oyster oyster, mm-hmm. which uh, no other drum company had these colors. It was exclusive to them, like like Mark Cooper would tell you, and and I believe it was made right here locally at the Dunlop plant. Hmm. Can I say that a hundred percent? No, but I I I I believe that it was because Dunlop is basically just a few miles from uh, the Kent factory on Military Road. It would make sense. I mean, yes, if it's right yes. there. Um, so I'm looking at some of the the catalogs that um, Mark Cooper has um, on his website, and it's it's neat to look at the um, the prices um, where you know an American 124 drum outfit, as they call it, or American 89 um, drum outfit, which I guess you, you basically get. Uh, you get everything. Um, it's two hundred sixty-five dollars in the mid. Let's call it the mid sixties. Well, you know, it's funny because, like, like I say, they they kept their prices way down. But when I when I okay that catalog you're looking at when I when I look at drums today, mm-hmm. it seems like it it sounds strange, but it seems like if you look at the prices in the catalog, that's what they're going for in today's market. Yeah. Some people get carried away and try to sell Kent drums for, you know, like a full drum set for $1,200, which I think, which is crazy, I think, because, yeah. you know, um, it's just, I don't, I don't, I, a nice Kent drum set, I would price between four and $600, you know, depending whether if it had double lugs, if it has single lugs, that brings the value down. Um, yeah. It's, it's strange because. I've I've gone on eBay and I've I found snares for like thirty dollars, and and then right as of today there's some on there for like two hundred sixty seven dollars. Would I would I pay two hundred sixty seven if it was a snare that I didn't have that had a rare uh, color? I would, mm-hmm. and I have because I've I've basically tried to uh, purchase every known Kent color available. Yeah, and I think I'm pretty close to doing that. You know. <laughs> They've made a lot of different different wraps, a lot more than people uh, realize. 
Yeah. Like they had they had their ma- mahogany um stained shelves, but then later on in the late sixties they came out with a mahogany wrap, which is plastic. Oh cool. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize that. I have a couple of them in my possession. And getting back on the the, the piece. Sure. Like the five piece sets I believe Kent started making in the late sixties. And if you look at the catalogs, but what they did was they had that little L arm where they just added another one on the other side. And then it wasn't until, you know, not too long after that, what they did was they started using made in Japan parts Mm -hmm. where they could mount two Tom Toms on their bass drum. And then they started bringing in stuff like made in Japan lugs, uh, snare throws kick pedals yeah that's that's when they transitioned transitioned from uh from made in the usa to made in japan yeah i mean in you know i i'm sure i'm not the only one thinking of, about early on you know about how they were making drums for you know like you said white badge where you can put any like revere where you can put something on there like that's that is totally what the japanese brands did so they're almost like the uh Amer- I'm sure there was some other guys uh doing it at that time but like they're like the um American version of that where instead of it being like Star who was making like you know Apollo and all these other brands whatever there's tons of them um it would be Kent do you find more Kent drums themselves or do you find more Revere and other drums that are um that are labeled differently and and on that note how can you tell uh, is there a particular thing it says on the badge or something like that that'll let you know this is actually a Kent drum with a different label on it? Like, how can you um, tell that you've got a Kent drum instead of a Japanese drum um, before when they were American made, when they were just kind of white labeling it? Well, how how you could really tell is just by the parts, mm-hmm. you know, the, the snare throw throw off because they, they've actually had like four different throw offs. And you could you could really tell by the butt end piece because Kent had this big huge butt end and they used it throughout their career, so it, it, you could just tell by the parts, gotcha. um, by the out eyelets. Uh, and I would say I have more Kent snares and, and and drums than all the other stuff, but I do have a lot of Revere because they did make a lot of Revere drums. Probably that was their first major customer was Revere, actually. Hmm. So you're talking early 50s. Uh, they made a lot of Revere drums, and you could find them to this day um, quite easily. Some of the other drums are harder to find, like uh, Lido. Um, Paramount uh, pops up. And I actually found a drum. that ha- It's a Kent drum that has a Lincoln a yellow Lincoln badge on it. But mm. when I asked uh, William, he, he said, no, they did not make Lincoln. But the, the thing is, you have to remember when I was interviewing Bill, he was in his, he was in his nineties and he, yeah. he can't remember everything. No. And if you're doing a run of them and you're doing a lot of these and it's, you know, 50 years earlier or whatever, maybe you, I mean, that's, easy to kind of forget that and w- would it be safe to say that a lot of the badges no matter what they say might say like uh new york on it or like made in new york it seems like like i'm looking at on the cooper's vintage drums where there's pictures that say paramount quality drums new york uh that seems like it might be a bit of a giveaway as well oh yeah absolutely because you know um people don't realize too they made drums for musketeer and, and that's that's a New York drum. So there there was probably some association early on with Musketeer when they were still on Long Island. Yeah. And I have complete sets, but I can't say complete set because a lot of the older um, drums that I have, and I feature them in my book, uh, they, they they didn't come with floor toms, which is a god awful shame. Yeah, they sold a lot of three piece sets, but a lot of companies did Rogers, Gretsch, and it's just a shame because sometimes finding a Kent floor tom to match your set is one of the hardest things to do in the Kent market. Hmm. A lot of people have three piece sets, and and they're always looking for that uh, that floor tom to go with it, and it's 
Yeah. It's it's a shame that there's so many sets without without floor times. I mean, is that because like I think of beginner drums, I think of my first drum set, which was a little, you know, rinky dink bass drum tom snare, which was nowhere near the quality of a Kent, but like is it just because it's like that's beginner drums is like, you know, these are for starting drummers uh and there just wouldn't be a floor tom right i mean yeah, yeah i i believe you're right because you have to you have to you have to master the snare and then when you're just learning how to play you, you don't have time to be figuring out the floor tom if you're just just sitting on there for the first time so they they were starter drum sets yeah i mean but you can go to the factory and you can order like uh like walter kent would say um miss you could have this three piece set for $160 but you could have a complete set mm -hmm. for another $42 and that would give you the floor time yeah but a lot of people didn't do that 42 $42 was a lot of money to spend and if you're buying your son a christmas gift um the three piece set is good enough yeah yeah, there's there's some interesting, um, you know, setups where I'm looking at one um, that is the three piece semi professional where it doesn't have a floor tom where it's like, that sounds about right. It's semi professional to not have it. But then the uh, the number 800 would be four piece drum outfit, the ultra deluxe, uh, which has a floor tom. But interestingly enough, there's there's there appears to be one uh, which is number 500 on this catalog i'm looking at where it's twin tom tom outfit so it's got two toms but it has no floor tom <laughs> which now that's uh that's just that, that feels wrong to me <laughs> like just, oh, oh without a doubt <laughs> to play that it would be awkward I, you know like or or it could just be a display showing what you get because then if you look in the back of those catalogs yeah. it'll list all the floor times that you could you could buy but what you know because they had people come in and uh take photos of these uh these drums and then they would actually make the catalog yeah out of all the catalogs i have i believe only three of them were were manufactured by kent and the rest were manufactured by other companies really explain yeah, that a little more so like the cat so meaning they just send some photos and then people would because i think drum catalogs throughout history is a is a whole fascinating topic um of things being in a catalog that never got created or things like that. So uh, explain that a little more. So they, someone else would just take pictures and then create a catalog for them. Yeah. Um, when they're on Nichols place, uh, William told me that somebody would contact them that would want to uh, sell their drums. So they would come to Kent's factory, set, set up a little studio and they would take photos and then, and then they would produce, produce the catalog and then naturally they would get the drums from from Kent, and um, and I, I guess in a way it's, they're sort of like, you know, helping them out. Mm -hmm. It's like outsourcing, basically. Yeah, and and that's just the way way they did it. Uh, like one of one of uh, Kent's first catalogs that they actually uh, produced themselves is a picture of a young man. On the front cover behind a, a five-piece set, and um, it was made in 1962. And this young man just happens to be William Kent Jr. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Um, all right. So, and I'm 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 looking at, I'm reading along, uh, just kind of checking out here. There's some um, there's some uh, an interesting blurb. I think it's cool to read, kind of just how they were talking in the. In that day, um, it says on the page that describes the outstanding specifications, which I won't get into all that, but it says at the top, it says the drums listed in this catalog are made by skilled American craftsmen in a modern American factory and have been for the last 30 years. All workmanship is unconditionally guaranteed. Below are some outstanding features not found in imported drums. So it seems like that's a little bit of like a, hey, buy these here, um, you're not going to get this kind of quality on the other import drums that all the other companies were competing with. Um, so they had kind of an interesting uh, slot in the market 
where they were the American drums for the, you know, beginners and the youth where I know Ludwig and Gretsch and everyone else had those lower end drums as well. But they kind of were smart to say, no, 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 like this is our avenue. But on that same note, it's kind of like they I don't want to say they they caved in later, but they did go to the Japanese outsourcing themselves. Right. Was that a financial hey, we got to do this. We got to get lugs made up. And I know there's some snares that were made over there. Uh, was that just due to like necessity of uh, the economy or things like that? Remo Ballet was at the, the NAM uh, show and he was talking to William Kent and he told Bill, he goes, Bill, he goes, you might be in trouble. The Japanese just um, constructed like 28 factories in order to uh, manufacture low-end drums and they knew that was going to be a problem because that was going to be taking their their business away and that's what slowly happened Mm -hmm. uh you know all these pearl drums with the different names started coming out in the 1960s and and kent was losing business so by the uh late 60s early 70s um kent started importing shells from japan um, and they started slapping their hardware on, putting their badge on it, and selling them as made in J- made in uh, the USA drums. But mm. they weren't. It's it's very strange because you have you could find Kent drums with Japanese shells, but all Kent hardware, and you could find Japanese shells with Japanese hardware. Mm. It's like it's like Kent didn't have no quality control. They just they just threw together drums and they didn't care what was on them or, or nothing. Yeah. And they just they, they they had inventory and they just tried to keep moving it. An interesting story that I heard. Um, this is in my book. A friend of mine named Greg Zark. He said he went into the Kent factory in the early 70s. Because uh, Kent factory had a fire in 1971 and greg told me that the machines for manufacturing the shells were damaged you know water damage you know what yeah. that does to steel sure so that could be another reason why they, they couldn't manufacture shells so they started importing uh the made in japan shells yeah. and then they're using up their hardware and it was right around that time where the kent japanese drums were born right around that period yeah uh and it's a shame it is a shame but it's like necessity i mean it's sort of one of those things where it's like you know would you rather the company go out of business because they you know they had to or they had to pivot they, they seem like pretty smart businessmen um who who made a pretty good run of it um were they i, I would consider them successful right i mean as a family a business you know minded family making drums that was the company was around for uh, in, into the seventies, right? Yeah, they closed their doors in nineteen seventy seven. They weren't really manufacturing. They they probably were fate, faded out even before that. But they actually closed the doors in seventy seven. And and I was told by Marcia Kent, which is um Walter Kent's daughter, that there was nobody that w- could or would take over the business. They didn't have no. Hmm. No, you know, nobody to take it over. That that person probably would have been William Kent Jr. But um, sadly, in 1964, two weeks after the Beatles came to America, he died in a car crash oh, man. as a passenger wow. at the age of 20. Oh my God, that's terrible. Yeah. So so Bill Kent told me he was devastated for years. Didn't think he can go on, and he Bill. Bill Jr. probably would have kept the business going. And maybe they would have had new machinery made. Mm. But in it, so then there was no other no other male in the family. Um he just he just had a couple of sisters and some cousins, but there was nobody that really could take over the business, so they decided just to cl- shut the doors. And after the, after the, they all retired in their like late sixties mm. and Edward went on to travel the world. Uh, 
you know, he, he ended up um, being a pretty rich man by, you know, playing the stocks. Yeah. According to Will, William, that is. Hmm. And like I say, I, I knew I knew Bill um, until he passed away at the age of 99. 99, man. Talk about a long yeah. life. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and he went through most of that life without his son, which That's, is another uh, remarkable yeah. thing. Unbelievable. He, That's so he terrible. Just, he just kept going on. Yeah. Jeez. Well, it's kind of one of those what could have been um, – type deals but yeah are, so we that's the end of the company but i do want to back up a little bit and and ask about so you said you know obviously when the beatles um you know came and everyone wanted to become a drummer in the 60s so they they ramped up production i mean so obviously they became as you mentioned before uh which i'd love some more detail on very 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 busy um what was their peak like number of employees because it's not that big of a building no. they're they're in <laughs> so i'm not sure what their peak was but um, they they here's the thing they they had their regular employees, but they also hired a lot of college students and even high school students, you know, from Buff State, UB, Kenmore West High School, and they would do all the stuff like make tambourines, put the lugs on the drums, like uh yeah this I I ended up meeting. Um, Justin Boncourt, who, uh, who now lives in California, Oceanside, he was a Kent employee from like 1965 to 68. And he told me countless stories about Walter, how he would walk past the factory and he would be picking the garbage, taking drum wrap out and Walter would come out and chase him away. (laughs) Finally, yeah. Finally, when he was 16, he went up to Walter and said, Walter, I got my working papers. Can I get a job here? Walter looked at him and said, "All right, come on, kid, get over here." <laughs> and he he worked there, and he he said it was it was the, one of the highlights of his life. Oh boy, uh, working in that factory, and you know, I w- I wish I could have been in that factory when it was around, but yeah. I just I was a little bit too young. Yeah. Speaking of that, I'd like to get away from that for a second. Sure. I would like to talk about. Um, how this book actually came about. Yeah. We'll cue it up with the name of the book. And that's a great transition. And just like a little info about, you know, obviously it's a book on the history of Kent, but maybe the, like the formal title and all that stuff and then carry on. Well, I wasn't sure what to call the book. And, uh, it was actually William Kent that you said, just call it the history of the Kent drum company. So it was his idea. Cause I didn't know if I should call it history of the EW Kent drum company. He said, just, make it the history history of Kent Drum Company, 1946, 1977. Perfect. Yeah. So what had happened was in the mid-1970s, my brother was a drummer in a band called Hot Numbers, and it featured Bob Farmer on guitar and, and lead vocals, and he had written a song called Turning Wheels On and On, and it was actually featured on – um wysl and wphd presents west new york's best new talent Hmm. and they they had the song and they were getting airplay and it was right around this time when my brother bill started suffering from headaches and nosebleeds and he just didn't feel right he knew something was wrong so he went to the local doctor and the local doctor thought he was just you know doing drugs or something (laughs) so finally Finally, Billy, um, he took himself to uh, Roswell Park and got tested, and he ended up uh, having a uh, a brain tumor in the back of his uh, um, brain stem. Oh, my God. And so he went in for, for an operation, and I remember that day well. I remember seeing my parents, my brother Dave and I were dropped off at a, at an aunt and uncle's house, and then... Billy had the operation, and all I remember, I was like 15 at the time, that my my mother was crying, and when they came back, and my father just looked real sad. So I knew something was wrong, but it wasn't until like two weeks later that my father came up to my bedroom and said, said, sit down, I got to tell you something. He was, he was, Billy has um, brain cancer. Mm. He has cancer, and he had a tumor, but they couldn't get it all. Oh, my God. 
So long story short, he Billy went went in the next couple of years. He, he got really bad, came very close to death. And in, in this time period, I was playing his set of Rogers uh, drums, and I so I started gaining an, in, an interest uh, on the drum set. So he starts getting better, and and and, and at that time when he was real sick, he, he gave me his Rogers. And I knew deep down that, um, yeah, because hmm. ap- after my father told me Billy's prognosis, they gave him six months to live. Uh, he goes, my father goes, you can cry. I said, I can't because I, I don't believe it. Wow. So so then Billy starts getting better, right? And he's back on his feet because he was confined to bed, a wheelchair. Sure. And he's, he's doing much better. Um, they're, they're actually showing signs of of. Uh, not having cancer. And I told him, I, I said, Billy, um, I need a drum set. So that's that's how this all started because he, he had a friend of his who just happened to own like a five piece set of Black Diamond Pearl Kents. So I purchased a set for $100. And, and that's where I, I basically taught myself. I would sit, sit, uh, and listen to records and try to try to play. Wow, that's awesome. And so after that, my, my brother's cancer free, he gets married, and life is good. So fast forward to 2006, I'm scrolling eBay, become a recent member, and I see this blue sparkle Kent snare drum for like 40 bucks. I'm like, man, I... I don't even know what I did with my Kent drum set. I knew I didn't have them, but I, I don't remember what I did did with them. Gave them away, traded them in, not sure. So I win the snare drum, and, and it piques an interest. So then I win something else and this and that. And So my wife and I, we, we go to, to a fish fry, and there was this band playing. And uh, they were called the Electras, and it featured Robbie Scheuer on drums. So in between sets, you know, me, I always go up to the drummer and I was talking to him and this and that. And then we became friends, sort of. So I we go to a, uh, my daughter's volleyball game at Kenmore West and I'm looking behind the bench and I see Robbie. I said, what the hell is he doing back there? So after the game, I asked my daughter, I go, I go, I go, Mary, I go, I go, what's what's Robbie? Oh, he's an assistant coach. I said, really? Wow, small world. <laughs> yeah. So so I go catch up with him, and I'm talking to him, and I go, hey, Robbie, you never know what I picked up on eBay uh, the other day. Picked up a Blue Sparkle Kent snare. He goes, oh, excellent. He goes, my first set of drums were a set of Black Diamond Pearl Kents in the 1960s. I said, that's funny because I, ha- I had the same type of set. So now this this actually leads me to writing this book. So this is a very important part. Yeah. He goes to me, he goes, he goes, well, I see Edward Kent, you know, walking the, walking the streets, you know, going for walks. I said, what? I go, he's still alive. He says, yeah, he lives over there on, on Woodcrest. And I'm like, I'll be damned. So I go home, I look in the phone book and there he is. Edward W. Kent, E.W. Kent, Man. the owner of Kent drums. And I'm like, <laughs> flabbergasted yeah so i think i probably had a couple beers i'll be honest i'm (laughs) nervous yeah i go okay i'm calling ed kent i call him he picks up hello edward kent who's calling please (laughs) (laughs) and very you know stern very you know he was a very proper man always wore suits and i tell him my little story and what i'm what i'm trying to do is write a history book and he invites me over. So I take three snare drums and I have him sign the heads on the three drums. And we're talking. And, you know, I ask him, what well, can I call you and get more information? He goes, oh, I'm not sure. I'm pretty busy. I said, I said, you could really help me out here. He goes, <laughs> he goes all right. When you want to call? <laughs> so so this led to me calling him a, a couple years later. And I said, Edward, how you doing? No, this is not Edward. This is William. Who's <laughs> calling? I said, oh, 
I, I, and I told him who I was and what I was doing. He goes, he was Ed's real sick right now. Mm. So I, uh, I can't help you. He goes, maybe, maybe in the future, I, I can maybe help you with your, your Kent drum book. I said, okay. So a couple months go by and, uh, I see Edward's death notice in the Buffalo news. Mm. And I, I, I had missed it by a day and I, I wasn't able to go to the funeral. So I was kind of upset about that. Yeah. So I write a condolences letter to uh, William, and he called me and left a message on my machine, and he said, said, Dennis, William Kent. He goes, I can help you with your book, but not now. Really busy, really busy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow. This is this is insane. <laughs> yeah. So after that, he just he started sending me letters. Okay, what what do you want to know? The start of Kent, where we got our hardwood hardware made and whatnot. So we start going back and forth with these letters, and 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 we talked on the phone quite often. And I, I asked him. I said, I said, Bill, did you find that box of the Kent badges? at Edward's house. He goes, he goes, where were they? I said, well, he ha showed me them. They were in his kitchen. A week goes by and I open the door to get the mail and the box is sitting wow. in my hallway, taped up with duct tape <laughs> and he scribed my name on it, had his sticker with his address. And I, I, I had to painstakingly take this black duct tape off to, to not damage the box. Yeah, because that's the original I, box. The original box. Wow. So that's one one of the gifts that he wow. that he gave me. And so so that's basically if not for William Kent and Robbie Scheuer and my brother Bill, who got me started on drums, this book, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Man. And so that's how I, I have those three people to thank the most. Man. Well, first off, the part about your brother and just dealing with that as a kid is just like unbelievable. And it's so like um, miraculous that he went through that and fully recovered. And um, I mean, my God, that's lucky, you know, I mean, that's um, unbelievable that you had to go through that as a kid, but uh, it kind of, like you said, it puts you on the right course of playing the drums and, and doing all this and, and uh, it's kind of like it's meant to be a little bit, you know, like all this, these connections and where you because you're you live in Buffalo, correct? Yeah, I live in a suburb of Tonawanda. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, as as my mail and address is Kenmore. So I tell people I live in Kenmore because that's where Kent drums are from. Got it. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. But I mean, just your G the 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 geography of all of it. Everything is is very um I mean, you're the guy. <laughs> you know, well, the, the, the Kent factory is is like, I don't know. I uh, it's like uh, twenty blocks away from my house. Wow! I just go down the street, cut over to military, drive up military, and it's right there on the left hand side. Did you move into your house because of the proximity to the factory? Did that have anything? No, to <laughs> no. I actually moved to Tonawanda in, in 1990. Okay. With my wife Karen, and we uh, had have two daughters, Mary and then Carrie. Yep. And we've been here 31 years now. I, and I always told myself, yeah, this is our starter house. And look at what happened. <laughs> yeah. Which, congrats, <laughs> your daughter recently got married. So a big congrats oh. to you know, shout out to to her for that. That's a huge, absolutely huge yeah. step. Um, I have a son now, William. Yep. Yep. That way, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. Yes. It's and, all, and, yeah, yeah. That that was a strange thing too. See, I see. I I like talking about synchronous or synchronicities. I mean, yeah, sure. And and like, I was gonna name uh, my second daughter after me and my brother. My my wife thought she was carrying a boy, mm -hmm. and my boy's name was gonna be William Dennis Brown. But then when the girl popped out. I had to come up with a different name. So <laughs> yeah. I gave her Carrie Lynn Brown. Yeah. And so then she meets and marries a guy named William. So it, it's really strange how, how things work. It is. It is very strange. I mean, but, but it's, it's all meant to be. And, and, um, so 
people can get your book where? Um, Because I highly, again, people should check it out if they, I'm I'm sure it goes much more detailed. We've just had a great conversation kind of jumping around and doing the history of the company and all this stuff. Um, But, you know, if you want to read the full on, you know, everything that Mouse has put together, where can people find the book? Okay. Probably the easiest way is to go on eBay, punch in Kent drums and keep scrolling until you see my book. Okay. It, it lists for $25 plus a flat rate of seven ninety five to ship anywhere in the country. Sure. Um, I also do take PayPal. So if you go to vintage Kent drums appreciation page, you'll see my ad on there and I explain ways of getting the book. And one of them, you can call mouse directly on my personal cell phone. I'll take phone calls. I'll, hey, I'll, I'll you're a man I of the people. To, <laughs> I had to deliver a book, uh, out to Clarence, New York, because the guy wanted to save shipping costs. And he just happened. He's from Rochester. He just happened to be in the area. Wow. I said, well, when do you want to meet? I'll bring him out to you. So I drove him out to him, man. He saved, I'll, eight, I'll do anything. I'll do anything, $8. <laughs> you know, and I'll do anything to satisfy my customers. And, and you know what? I, I did this not for monetary gain. Um, I paid $5,000 to get this book printed. Uh, I, wow. I, there's 500 books printed, but I had to sell 200 of them in order to get my money back, yeah. which I'm, I'm very close to, to be in there. But then if I don't sell, let's just say I sell 200 books and I don't sell anything after that. I don't make any money, but you know what? I'm okay with that. I didn't do it for the money. I did it to give the Kent drums and the Kent family um, a name name in history, yeah. which I truly believe they need and should have, and and a good name. Not not all Kent drums are crap. I wouldn't buy a set of Kent drums because they're not. Everybody sure. had issues with quality. I don't care. You could talk to Mark Cooper and. He he's seen bad quality on Rogers and Ludwig drums. Yeah. So I did it um, because I love Kent drums. Uh, I I, they just fascinate me because you know anybody could write a a book on on Ludwig, Mm -hmm. but when I had the opportunity to write the very first ever book on Kent, I grabbed it. Like like William Kent said, Dennis, you. Came after the information. You got it. Now do something with it. Yeah. He's a doer. You're a doer. But he's obviously, uh, you know, he instilled that in you a little bit too. But, man, he, he was a, a a mover and a shaker, obviously. Um, oh, absolutely. And, 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 Bart, to be perfectly honest with you, when I started this project, I'm like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> yeah. And then when, when William passed away, his granddaughter, Rachel actually mentioned me in a death notice oh boy wow um that i was local drummer writing a history book about ken and i'm like i can't back out now now can i (laughs) yeah that's uh i think to myself multiple times uh a a month maybe multiple multiple times a week what the hell have i gotten myself into with (laughs) with doing all this exactly but it's because yeah it's it's i have so many hours in it and it's just like you have so many hours in your podcast yeah you'll never get those hours back but it's doing something you enjoy yeah and it wouldn't it would only be you know not a waste but if you didn't finish it then what's the point so you did finish it and it's out there and for ease of, um, you know, for everyone, I, per usual, will put uh, the link to the Vintage Kent Drums appreciation page uh, in the description. And then I'll, I'll go ahead and find that link for eBay. And then I'll put that in the um, description for the podcast as well. So people can oh, go ahead great. And, and click there. And uh, I mean, you know, a lot of my listeners who I talk to pretty regularly love these books and just kind of put it in their their library of drum books. So I think you know, and it's it's good to buy it as well because let's let's help Mouse get across that uh, you know let's let's get him profitable here um, for everyone. But yeah, all right. So that was awesome. Um, I want to ask you one last thing, and then we'll kind of wrap up here. But if if you find a vintage Kent drum set, do you recommend? It seems like something for quality wise, a good kind of quick semi affordable way to to 
kind of uh, button up some quality issues would be getting the bearing edges recut. Is that probably a, a smart thing to do if you find an old Kent drum set? Yes, yeah, that is a smart thing to do because the drums of the 50s, they did have beautiful edges. But as the 60s came and the, and the Beatles shook uh, shook the world, it kind of like went out the window, so to say. I mean, they were working seven or eight days a week, like the Beatles said. Yep, yep. Uh, I'm doing my Ringo Starr impersonation. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's okay. bearing edges. And the other thing I do um, when when I... When I look for Kent drums, I don't buy any drums with drilled holes in the shells. Okay. I don't buy any drums that somebody put a Ludwig uh, throw on the Kent snare because that means they had to drill extra holes. I try to buy nothing but original. Yeah. Um, like when I find a, a decent 50s Kent snare with calfskin heads, I go for it because sure. there's not a lot of them out there. Um, you know, Bart, I'll be honest with you. I, I own over probably close to uh, 200 snare drums <laughs> and like 20 Kent drum sets, two of them being made in Japan Yeah, because I just wanted to see what how they constructed and all that. That's awesome. And it, it's funny because I did pick up a, a – now, like I say, I'll never mock a Japanese – quality or nothing yeah. they, they made some good stuff i picked up a drum set put them in my truck the next day i had a gig i had to you know uh and i'm like well why take these out and put in a kent set i go let me just try try this set i just need my hardware my cymbals kick pedal and those the drums sounded awesome yeah i, I was quite surprised but they, they do sound good so i there's my little plug for made in japan drums you know <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of you know, all in the same universe a little bit of like affordable, nice vintage drums that have their own, um, again, they're their own subcategory of the drum world. But um, I, before we move more into that uh, conversation, I do, you kind of read my mind. I want to do uh, this week's bonus episode, which uh, for everyone listening, Mouse has been kind enough to take a couple extra minutes, and I want to ask him about um, his personal collection, which he just alluded to, and and kind of maybe some some horror stories of getting you know something that wasn't that he what he thought, or um, maybe you know paying you know getting a great deal, or the opposite, which was you you got bid bid up too high, or just anything like that, and and some of your favorites. So um, for that, you can go to drumhistorypodcast dot com, and there's a Patreon button. And you can click and you'll get these bonus episodes um, for as low as $2 a month, which there's been a bunch of new people on Patreon recently. So I really appreciate that. So you can look forward to that. And and before we wrap up, um, let's give another quick shout out to our uh, our friend Donnie Baird for connecting us because that's just awesome. Um, and per usual with when I use his website, uh, Mark Cooper, who's just a great friend of everyone in the drum community. Um, so thanks to those two guys for connecting us. Cause otherwise we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have done this. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, uh, you know, a little plug to Mark when I first found Cooper's vintage drums, I didn't know nothing about vintage drums and he had that little, uh, Kent history part on, on, on his site. And that was one of my inspirations to do a book also. Yeah, I have to say, I have to thank Mark for that because when I saw that, I'm thinking, you know, you, you sh somebody should make that into a book rather than needing to go online. Because I've been in the printing industry for 40 years, and I like, I like to put a book in my hand. Sure, uh, nobody's got time. You can't carry your, well, you can carry your laptop, but it's just <laughs> it's more, different, more convenient to just have a book in your hand. I like printed items because I'm a pressman. I'm a printer. Yeah. by heart you know yeah. so so no, thank totally. you mark yeah thank you mark and the first episode first five episodes i ever recorded of the podcast his website was up and you know i'm kind of following along which it's it's neat i get to do that right now as well so um well mouse thank you for being here everyone again can find the description um uh the links in the description of what to look out for for um for the book so on that note we'll hop over and do the bonus episode so mouse thank you for being here 
Okay, Bart, thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it, and uh, you have a pleasant evening. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.